let's see. Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, if you're here, uh, this is the right place for the Great River School. I think right here, the Great Great River School, Great River School logo right there. Great River School uh, Elementary Open House. And this is a webinar, meaning that you can attend and uh, you can hear me. Uh, and you can also ask questions. So it's a participatory webinar. Uh, right at the bottom of your screen down here, you'll see a Q&A box. Uh, that Q&A box has uh, two little dialogue chats. You can click there and type in a question. Um, uh, that is much better than chatting me. Uh, chat is, is hard for me to track, but down here at the Q&A, you can type in a question. And um, I see a good number of folks are streaming in, filling our Zoom room. Um, so I'll give them a moment and uh, get my screen ready to share. Uh, again, if you have specific questions, uh, I have a short presentation um, that I'm going to give. It takes, oh, hopefully we'll see, uh, probably about 10 minutes. I'll go pretty quickly through it. Um, but then, then we'll spend a lot of the time uh, answering your questions. Um, so uh, I think I'm about set for doing that. Good. And um, those of you who are just coming in now, good, we're stabilizing here. Uh, those of you who are, who are uh, just coming in now and maybe didn't hear me when we, when we just started right at 8.30 was, uh, if you have questions, put those in the Q&A down there at the bottom of your screen. Um, and that Q&A is a good place to track the questions you might have. Um, if you're willing or interested in speaking, you can raise your hand and I'll take verbal questions also. Um, and now that I see the attendees here, uh, oh, good. Um, I think, uh, I think we will, without any further ado, begin. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Sam O'Brien. And um, when not in the spotlight, uh, and sometimes when in the spotlight, I am uh, head of school here at Great River School. Um, it, is, it is not a typical year. Usually, I would be standing in front of you. Um, it would be a little earlier in the evening. We'd have child care, and we'd be on the campus here in St. Paul uh, at Great River School. Um, but right now, we're in Zoom. Uh, participating in our first ever evening of open houses um, through a virtual space. So uh, I'm going to, I'm going to, oh, good, we got some questions forming. Oh, good, good, good. Um, uh, I'm going to talk uh, just generally about the school through our presentation, and then um, I'll be able to answer specific questions uh, as we go. Um, so without further ado, here we are, sharing my screen. And... All right, broadcasting. If there's any problems with the audio or anything else, uh, please put that, uh, mention that in the Q&A um, and, I'll, and I'll address that. So uh, Great River School, again, this is an information session. We're gonna focus on the elementary program uh, for tonight. Uh, hopefully our timing after most bedtimes uh, for elementary age students. Uh, I know my own elementary age students are um, either just landing in bed or I just finished reading a story to them. Um, so who are we? Uh, Great River School, we're a Montessori public school, uh, and specifically our learning community prepares students for their unique roles as responsible and engaged citizens. Um, so the way that we do that um, is uh, by using the Montessori method. So in the elementary program, we have a lower elementary, which is grades one, two, and three together. And then in the upper elementary, grades four, five, and six uh, are together in classrooms. That means we have multi-age classrooms um, of first, second, and third year students together in one lower L classroom, we call it lower elementary. Uh, and then fourth, fifth, and sixth graders together in one upper elementary classroom. So that fourth year student who enters the upper elementary classroom would then become a fifth year student in the same community. And then as a sixth year would be a leader in that community. And then as and the second half of their sixth year would be looking toward uh, departing and preparing their classroom for them to leave. Um, same thing with first, second, and third graders. Um, so uh, what do we do? Uh, we do overnight trips uh, in um, non-pandemic times. And specifically, we call these things key experiences. Um, in the elementary level, our upper elementary uh, participates in an, um, an overnight experience, uh, usually at a wilderness camp. Um, and our lower elementary also does a single overnight in a typical year. Um, now, in a year of distance learning, um, we do other activities to give students a group experience of doing a hard challenge or challenging um, event together. Um, so we don't do overnight trips when the pandemic is going on, but we do have plans to re-engage in those safely uh, when, again, case rates and, and um, uh, pandemic uh, signs are down. Um, 
There we go. Uh, so then uh, we also engage in community meetings. So your classroom community will gather up uh, sometimes once a week, um, sometimes more often uh, to have discussions about what's going well, what could go better, compliments and thank yous we want to give to people in our community. And this thing that we say about growth mindset academics specifically is that uh, on one column here is an image where you see a description of the fixed mindset. And then on another uh, side is the growth mindset. A fixed mindset belief would be that um, intelligence is static, meaning you're either good at something or not good at something. You're either smart or not smart. We don't we don't talk that way. We don't believe that at Great River School and specifically in Montessori education, we believe intelligence can be developed. So your response to a challenge is to be inquisitive and think more about it. You engage in asking questions about things you don't understand. Um, you think that you can develop those new skills. Um, and so when we approach knowledge and learning that way, uh, we find that students succeed um, more often and we find that we are deconstructing often ideas that students have about being smart or not smart uh, and we're talking about either being comfortable or not yet comfortable doing something either um, something being fortunate or not fortunate either uh, something being um, new to you uh, or something that you've had experience with before um, so we uh, also emphasize the qualities of responsibility um, the four respects respect for yourself for others for your classroom uh, and for your work. And then we talk about interdependence. So we want students to develop independence, but we also want them to recognize that they need each other. And so we emphasize the uh, importance of a learning community, specifically that we have shared responsibility for making this a place that we can all learn, um, that everyone in this classroom, we need all of their contributions to solve the problems that we're gonna face together. And every single person in this community, whether it's the whole school or just your elementary classroom, every person is necessary to being that classroom. So everybody's size and shape and sound, everybody's contribution is unique. And with any one of those shapes or sizes or sounds missing from the classroom, it's not as full and rich a place as it was with everyone there. Um, so we're building the skills of resilience, understanding, and the ability to work in a group. Uh, we build on the experiences and capacity to try new things. And we want students to be open to experiences that are uncomfortable. We learn personal responsibility through chores, through making our work plans, and through relationships where we matter to each other. So we emphasize setting those groups up. Uh, your child will learn academic skills. We participate in the teaching of state standards and beyond. Uh, we also administer the uh, Minnesota comprehensive assessments that all public schools are mandated to carry out. Um, uh, I, I don't want to brush over these other items that I've also uh, mentioned, uh, but I do want to say that personal responsibility and a growth mindset attitude are the foundation of a student's academic engagement. And then also understanding their role in the community, we think is, 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 is the foundation of their uh, further success, both as an adolescent and then into adulthood. So um, we're a public school that uses materials for students to learn concepts that allow them to play a meaningful role in the world. Uh, Montessori materials, Montessori trained teachers, and hands-on curriculum, uh, those are the things that build um, the experience of going from a concrete experience to an abstract understanding. Um, at the uh, adolescent level, uh, that looks a little bit more like engaging in primary source documents, but at the elementary level, in all of the classrooms, first through sixth grade, uh, in lower and upper elementary, we use authentic Montessori materials like the ones you see here uh, on the bottom of your screen um, for studying uh, all, all, all of the academic studies. Um, in the 11th and 12th year at Great River School, students engage in the diploma program of their international baccalaureate organization. Uh, school transportation, we do have a, a limited number of yellow bus stops for first through sixth year students. Um, that limited number is that we stop at sites around St. Paul, uh, generally to pick up students and take them to school. Um, and uh, if you need transportation as an elementary family, we will make sure to provide it to you. However, if you live outside of the city of St. Paul and you need transportation, uh, we may not be able to get close to your home. And so that's a limitation we want to make clear so that we can be sure to provide the transportation that families need in the city of St. Paul. And in particular, for families for whom would not be able to attend school if there wasn't closer transportation. Um, we do have some satellite stops along the edges of St. Paul. And so if you live outside of St. Paul and you apply for enrollment and 
and can enroll, uh, you can come to the satellite stops also to get to school. Um, so that's, that's what I'll say about that. Uh, seventh through 12th year students, I know this is an elementary focus night, but just a heads up that we don't have seventh through 12th year students on our yellow school buses. We do provide adolescent students ages 12 to 18 in seventh through 12th grade with Metro Transit passes for taking the city bus or um, encouraging them to use the skills that we've learned uh, with them in safely biking uh, or, or otherwise walking to school. A typical day at Great River School in a, in a non-pandemic year at the elementary level would be a three-hour morning work period starting at 8.30 a.m., um, a beautiful lunch together in the classroom where the whole classroom is set up to eat lunch together in that room, a uh, 45-minute recess outdoors, and then an afternoon work period where you re-engage in the work or uh, exploration of that morning. Um, we do have uh, either time with a physical expressions, uh, PE instructor outdoors, uh, or visual arts instructor once a week. Um, at the adolescent level, uh, the typical day is not broken up that same way, though there is outside time and lunch for adolescents um, and more uh, typical, I would say, adolescent schedule, though with independent work time for adolescents. But at the elementary level, a very traditional Montessori day. Um, the activities generally available to adolescent students are listed here. Uh, we do have some clubs and after school activities for elementary students that include um, soccer, room ball, archery, basketball, uh, Lego league club, um, and then um, uh, sometimes in the past we've also had uh, dramatic arts and theater and um, some language sprouts activities for foreign language study. Um, and so uh, I do want to identify that we do approach uh, the job of public schooling uh, with growth mindset academics, like I said, focus on social emotional programs, and we do have clear boundaries and agreements that every elementary classroom would make. So all the elementary students would be guided by the adults in the room to make agreements for how will we talk to each other, how will we listen to each other, how will we act and speak with one another, and the way that we do that, we establish how the classroom looks, how it sounds, and how it feels, and we all make an agreement together to set that classroom contract, and that is the foundation of our understanding of building the community that is our learning community. Um, so uh, who checks on us? So I just want to talk for a few minutes here about the nuts and bolts of uh, what we do at school. Um, we do have a school authorizer that the state requires to check up on us and make sure that we're doing what we said we're going to do, uh, which we do quite well. Um, we also, again, engage in those Minnesota comprehensive assessments. And over the next few slides, I'll just show the outcomes of those comprehensive assessments. Though I want to emphasize that uh, the way that we achieve as a school is by including everyone by meeting the needs of all students individually and by en emphasizing meaningful work for those students to take responsibility for their work. And so here, what you can see is in um, yellow, this is the latest, latest data available. Uh, we don't have any data from the spring of 2020 as it was interrupted uh, by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, but uh, for our reading outcomes, you'll see that generally our students in grades three through 11 are scoring higher than state average shown there in gray and blue is the St. Paul Public School average. Um, in terms of reading growth, again, you can see our Great River School is here on the far left-hand side. Um, I'll try to use that pointer. Um, over here on the far left-hand side is Great, Great River School. You can see more Great River School students are making high growth than are making high growth at St. Paul or as a state as a whole. Um, and I just want to take a moment to say, I want there to be excellent schools everywhere in the state of Minnesota. I believe Great River Schools model serves many students very well. I know that there are many excellent St. Paul public schools and schools around the state of Minnesota. And I'm simply here aiming not to say other schools are not as good, but in fact, to show that there are some ways that we see students benefit from our school um, particularly. Um, so specifically also, uh, the trend in terms of um, uh, math learning at Great River School, we're shown here in yellow. Um, our students uh, are right around the state average in terms of overall math outcomes. But then when we look at growth in math, um, specifically Great River School students uh, as a um, percentage are showing more growth in mathematics at a high level than um, St. Paul or the state as whole. And again, I will identify here, we do have a number of students who are um, struggling with low growth and those students would be engaged with um, on a level of um, uh, interventions of using their independent work time to work on basic math skills and or 
functional math skills with their with their teachers, but I'll also identify that the MCAs are not the way that we do or learn math, especially in the elementary level. And so while these are an indicator that our students are learning successfully, they're not the only indicator of, of our success. Uh, and then a question that some folks ask, um, uh, especially I would say at the adolescent levels, but families who are really doing their research, you can look at school demographics. And uh, specifically, I wanna just identify a question that sometimes the crowd asks, and sometimes I feel that the question is either withheld or not asked openly, but if I ask it, maybe, maybe the conversation can be a little easier to engage in. So if you looked at the Minnesota State Report Card, which any of you can look up on Google, and it shows all the demographic and outcome data for all public schools in the state, you might say, um, there's something odd at Great River School in terms of a public school in the city of St. Paul. There are very few, if any other public schools, where a majority of the students would be white identifying by racial demographic. And so here what we see is St. Paul Public Schools demographics, uh, where again, white students are this uh, piece of the pie here, but then um, black, Asian, uh, Latinx, uh, Native American, and, and multiracial students are listed out uh, in, in these other groups. So students um, in St. Paul Public Schools make up only about 20% of the, of the population. And by a city citywide demographic look, again, um, white folks only account for about 65% of the total population. So at Great River School, we actually last year had a 73% white identifying student population. And um, specifically, we see uh, the need to educate non-white families about the impacts and the foundational values of Montessori education, uh, that we find that many, many families um, have, uh, if they don't know somebody at Great River School, then um, it's hard for them to trust that we are serving uh, students in a structured environment and really holding them to high standards, uh, which we are. It's not, it's not, a, it's not an open free-for-all. Um, secondly, however, uh, I wanna be clear that the segregation of schools uh, by race is not a problem unique to Great River School. And one thing that may be unique is how openly we talk about it and address it as a majority white school. So we do actively seek applicants from other neighborhoods um, and we do actively do outreach for families who are traditionally underserved by the educational system. Um, we also actively talk at age appropriate ways in the lower elementary and upper elementary and school wide uh, about systemic racism and oppression. Um, so we have outcomes to share also, and I want to share these outcomes so that um, you might see some of the uh, observed uh, performance benefits that we see students have academically, um, especially students who identify as Black, Indigenous, or students of color. Um, so specifically here across uh, racial demographics that are used by the state. So these are terms used by the state of Minnesota and federal government. And I just want to speak specifically to the fact that there are uh, many uh, ethnic identities and, and um, heritages that fit within this Latinx category uh, on the far right. There are many dozens of heritages and identities that fit in this Asian category. And again, the same for this Black category on the far left. Um, so uh, with that as a large preface, the way the state compiles and reports out this data, I want to identify that Great River School here shown in yellow um, does show here students on track for success in reading. And um, comparatively to the state and uh, St. Paul Public Schools as a whole, we are outperforming in growth for the students in these demographic areas. Uh, however, we're not done. I wanna see for all three of these bars, for all of these demographics, all of these students should be on track for success. And so that we are doing better is by no means a sign that our work is done. We have a lot of, we have a lot of work to do as a whole state and society. And we do see students succeeding well, I think because of the social emotional investment, the comfort they feel with each other as a learning community. Uh, and then specifically, if you look at the success in math here, um, Great River again is shown in yellow, we find that students um, uh, are making a large growth in math, um, even more so than reading compared to other districts. Uh, and so I just also want to identify that even at the elementary level, we do have uh, a largely visible and highly supportive um, uh, GSA, our LGBTQ plus club. Um, and then we also have special education and English learner programs uh, at all ages. Um, 
we ask of families that you engage in meaningful conversations at home about responsibility, that your kids have chores. We want your students to be doing chores at home and taking responsibility for the home environment. Uh, we also want you to be part of the solution. You're joining here as a learning community. So we are not a service organization. You're not signing up to get you know, the amazon.com of schools delivered to your door. You're signing up here to help us build every day, every month and every year, a learning community. And then also specifically, uh, we are offering family supports of parent education, meaningful work for your students, uh, engagement and support for students who are not uh, experiencing academic success, and then a place where, again, we're not a service organization, but we are a learning community where we need every family, every student, every parent to be contributing with your voice and your time and your energy to keep this place a living uh, entity. And so I'm going to stop my screen share at that uh, moment. Um, <laughs> you notice that I noticed that my tape on my cold wall needs to be reset. Uh, and I'm going to go to the Q&A. So I see, um, oh, great. You all have been so helpful putting your 12 questions in the Q&A. So uh, I'm going to start with the most recent question first and move back up. Um, so first question um, from Forrest Fleischman. Uh, how does the school deal with students who are behind in social emotional areas, um, i.e., possibly? Uh, maybe there are students who have been um, homeschooled because of the pandemic or haven't had a normal, say, kindergarten or early elementary experience. Um, so what, will that matter? Uh, specifically, we really emphasize social interaction as a foundation for learning in the Montessori uh, elementary classrooms. And so the way that we would engage with students coming out of this pandemic or students coming to first grade who have not been to a formal school yet um, probably will not look a lot different, though we will monitor to see how many more, say, inputs or practices we need to have of those kind of classroom agreements. Um, but the way that it would look is this, students are welcomed into the classroom. Again, students sit down and work together to uh, identify ways that they can agree to be together. Students will all say what, their class, what they want the classroom to look like, sound like, and feel like. And then through answering those questions, we'll make a classroom contract and then practice the social skills of engaging in your work, working appropriately with your friends, and then also working appropriately with your teachers and guides um, to help you engage in the work. Uh, I think that Montessori classrooms, though, are particularly well adept to helping students learn how to be in a classroom together because of all of the interesting work and manipulatives that are available to students' hands. Um, here we go. And now, uh, here we go, moving through the questions. Uh, what kind of special ed support is available and do we support autistic students? We do, in fact, about 20% of our school population has an IEP. Um, our specialized programs are not um, uh, as specialized or separated from the classroom as a larger school district might be. Uh, so again, we have about 30 to 35 students in a classroom and we have two adults, two general education adults in that classroom, a teacher and an assistant. And then in addition, we generally have um, about one special ed teacher for every 12 students with IEPs. Uh, and so what that means is that um, in any given classroom, likely somewhere between four and six students uh, or have an IEP for, for some something. It could just be something as, um, as routine and sort of once a week uh, in terms of its service as speech, or it could be something where a student is getting rather intensive um, support and guidance throughout the day. But for a student, say, who is experiencing autism, uh, that student, depending on their, de their degree of service needed, would um, often, say, meet with a social worker or meet with uh, their case manager, say, um, once a day or, or more often, and then would often have support and redirection and accommodations in the classroom that allow them to uh, participate successfully. Um, we do have after school and before care. Uh, there, I, I um, went over that, I, I passed that slide without presenting it, so forgive me. Um, but if you apply and are offered enrollment, we'll talk about that more um, in depth. But we do have before and after care options uh, that are both um, comparable to what you'd see, say, at St. Paul Public Schools or Minneapolis Public Schools in terms of the timing available. So as early as 7.30 that uh, before care starts and um, goes till 5.30 or 6, depending on your, on your needs. Um, and then specifically uh, in terms of cost, um, we do provide a competitive cost to other school districts um, before and after care, and families can also apply for, for a waiver or um, scholarship to that program. Um, how much do students in the lower school spend outside on a daily basis? Um, at least 45 minutes outside for recess, and then often time outside of the classroom uh, in the morning for, for projects or, or, or learning or, or what we call 
um, going outs where a student would research something and then look for a project and, and find a community resource to go visit and they would maybe go out and do that. Um, we also really try to get outside as much as possible, um, not only during uh, the school day, but say on a beautiful afternoon or for a lesson that has to do with observation or science or experimenting. Um, let's see. Oh, you thought this was the adolescent meeting. That's okay. The adolescent meeting was recorded and you can still ask a question if you would like anonymous attendee, though it looks like you might have left. Uh, how does the transition for kids that have been in non-Montessori going into Great River um, happen for so those be beginning in upper elementary? Um, the transition looks like, again, participating in those classroom meetings and contract settings at the beginning of the year, um, and then really engaging with a student to keep what's called a worker journal. So it's a single notebook where they would write down their work plan for the day. And that, that habit or practice is, is fairly intuitive. And then that student works with their guide, their adult, and the classroom assistant, the other adult in that room, to check in on what they should do next and how should they do it. Um, generally, students transition quite well. Um, the, the only exception to that, and this is something that I say at all levels, is that if a student is used to doing school just to finish the work or just to get a grade or just to get to the end of the worksheet, and then be done to try to finish their work as fast as possible and then be done with the work. It may be frustrating to transition to a school in which we're gonna ask a student who finishes their work to go over it with their teacher, look for places that they might be able to improve on it or, or go deeper into it and then go back and keep working. Because that, that would be the habit that we're trying to build at all ages in the Montessori environment is to engage with something, to find meaning in it, and then to be willing to go back and revise it and work more on it until you until you go deeper, until you can polish it up. Um, let's see. Uh, okay, um, just passing along the questions here. Could you speak to the outdoor environment available and how students use it in the winter versus warmer months? Well, in the winter months, students have more clothes on. Ha! And um, the outdoor environment, we have about a three and a half acre urban campus in St. Paul. Um, that uh, if you drive by, you can see right now. Uh, we do have students on campus currently uh, engaging in, in learning communities right there on campus, even while we're in distance learning. Um, students uh, use all of the campus, frankly. And when we do go outside, uh, we do go outside even in the winter to do explorations and academics. Um, and, and then at least 45 minutes a day of outside play, uh, unstructured recess play uh, for students. Let's see, um, this is recorded uh, for those of you who are wondering. Um, the teacher to student ratio in the elementary school, uh, I suppose I, I did refer to it earlier. Um, there are a, a somewhere between uh, 33 and 35 students in a given classroom. Um, we do have a licensed mon and trained Montessori guide uh, as a teacher. And then we have a, um, a classroom assistant who is an adult. Um, often our classroom assistants have a lot of experience in education. Sometimes they're also licensed teachers. Uh, and sometimes they also have Montessori training. Um, is there music instruction in the elementary level? Uh, yes, there is music instruction in the elementary level, um, both through the study of say tone bars and scales, uh, that would be a general education practice. And then also, especially in the older, say third through sixth grade, um, students exploring um, songs and songwriting and, and music playing and singing together uh, informally through um, stringed instruments like ukulele and guitar, but then also um, uh, through more formal study and research. And then in our seventh through 12th grade program, we have vocal and instrumental music instruction that's more formal. Uh, let's see, our kids are really interested in acting, musicals, bands, and singing. Are these activities available during the school day? Or are they only available as an after, after school activity? Um, so I would say, uh, Acting, musicals, uh, singing, and playing instruments are available during the school day through the student's independent pursuit. So um, we have students who bring in instruments and, and play them and use them as part of their learning or part of uh, their, their um, sort of explication of their understanding of the project that they're studying. Um, but in terms of, say, do we have acting class during the day, um, uh, instrumental music instruction during the day formally for elementary students, we do not. Um, we do have that for seventh through 12th grade students, but at the first through sixth grade level, uh, those activities are available during an after school activity um, or a club, um, and uh, they are informally available to students in first through sixth grade. How does Great River consider, um, have we considered eliminating sibling preference to help diversify the school? 
Um, specifically, we have looked at uh, ways we might be able to diversify the school by um, actively allowing folks to voluntarily identify themselves as either um, uh, qualifying, say, for free and reduced lunch so we can diversify our uh, socioeconomic uh, backgrounds. And um, right now there are state statutes and federal statutes that prevent us from asking about the race, ethnicity, or background of any of our applicants. Um, but we are looking at ways to diversify. Um, specifically in terms of sibling preference, um, we have not looked at eliminating sibling preference as a method of diversification. We have not found that that is an effective tool. Um, if, if we just simply eliminated sibling preference, um, we, we uh, do not have any further assurance that the folks who would be coming in would um, would have a wider set of uh, backgrounds than 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 the siblings. So um, uh, on the face of it, I know that it sounds like a, an idea to consider, um, but state statute also has uh, ha has the sibling preference as a way to make sure that families can. Um, sustain their enrollment at a school community. And so uh, what, what we have actually found is that sibling preference um, has allowed us to uh, further diversify racially and demographically our school um, when uh, families um, with many siblings uh, who are non-white uh, enroll. And so, and so I think I've said enough about that. I have other ideas I wanna talk about further, but it doesn't make, doesn't make sense tonight. So excuse my sort of lilting answer. <laughs> Thank you for your suggestion. Um, how do you ensure high achieving students are also challenged to the best they can and reach their potential? Well, um, Katie T, thank you for answering that, asking that question. I'll answer it this way. Um, uh, we want students uh, to be high achieving and specifically we actually witnessed that uh, all students are capable of high achievement. And in a typical school setting, where students who are say um, more apt or quick, more quickly pick up on skills uh, are given more opportunities, that that creates a, a wider difference in the experience of students and also their relationships. However, students who are say more apt or pick up quickly on a content area in a Montessori classroom are encouraged in fact, to go much deeper into the study of that area. So whether that's the study of landforms is basic geography study and then a student who really understands that quickly and is interested can go deeper into studying than geology and the, the reason for landforms and not only tectonic plates but uh, cutting edge science research is in the upper elementary right and would would go deeper into the study of landforms and the science of it. Um, in a way where they actually might engage in 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 upper school or high school or even sometimes college level in depth understanding of those concepts. But that student would again be studying right next to and in the same group as somebody maybe who's just wrapping their head around the concept. And so those students being near each other actually creates a dynamic environment where the learning can happen more effectively. Um, so the way we ensure that is by making sure that the work journal students keep and the meaning they see in their work is consistently both explained and understood by the students and the families. Uh, is there a foreign language or second language taught at Great River School? Uh, the short answer is yes, there is. And the longer answer is at the elementary level, we do not focus on studying or teaching foreign languages. Um, I, know, I know in particular, um, lately, uh, a lot of elementary families want to see their student exposed to or a part of an immersion program. Uh, we are not a language immersion program. We are a public Montessori program. And um, we do, however, have uh, a very successful successful Spanish language program at the seventh through 12th grade level. And then if you have further um, desire for your student to learn foreign languages, um, that is something, again, in a, in a uh, extracurricular way, sometimes students form or families form clubs and students participate. But at the first through sixth grade, we are not instructing foreign language. Um, however, if you are a family or a student who speaks a second language other than English uh, at home, uh, you can um, demonstrate proficiency in that language and earn academic credit for it, especially as an adolescent student uh, at Great River School. What about the goats? We have three goats. Uh, they are wonderful. They are used in many classes and to teach personal responsibility. And the goats are very cute and they often live on campus. And right now during the pandemic, the goats are still living at their summertime farm. So they're having a retreat away. Uh, let's see, Elizabeth Graham asks, how are families involved and included in the work of the school? Um, 
how are parents kept apprised of what's going on in the classroom? So uh, at the elementary level, there are um, regular uh, family communications from classrooms at least twice a month, uh, updating you on what's happening. Often they're once a week, updating you on what's happening at school and in the classroom. Um, uh, having uh, conversations with your children, having chores at home, uh, are, pr are primary ways to participate in the culture of the school. But then also uh, uh, we have a parent engagement group that plans um, only social connections and times for families to gather and build social relationships. So that parent engagement group is only a social network literally at school. So not a digital social network, but a real life in person when possible, um, even during the pandemic, uh, outdoor gatherings when they have been allowed. And when the pandemic is subsiding, those will start again, but even in a virtual community building uh, of families. So that's how families are involved. And then also families fill many volunteer commitments and, and campus commitments to the school. We do ask families uh, to volunteer their time and that can, that can count as attending performances and attending school events, but also um, staffing and helping to run those events and those performances. Uh, let's see. For what reasons does Great River School not offer kindergarten? Was the typical first grader look uh, like in terms of the formal education they've received before beginning? So the reason we don't offer kindergarten um, uh, primarily has to do with uh, as a three-year age grouping, um, kindergarten standing alone is not a um, uh, sufficient way to meet our Montessori mission as a school. Um, secondly, uh, the state funding for full day kindergarten over the last 15 years has not been consistent and so has not been um, literally has not been a possible program for a school to operate. And then third, we don't want to undermine successful Montessori programs that are running uh, through your age groupings by opening a kindergarten and, and pulling those families out of those communities. Um, however, uh, we do recognize that a lot of students where they start kindergarten um, maybe that's where they feel more, more, most comfortable. And so, so it is a question that we have visited and reflected on and, and have revisited and I'm sure we'll revisit in the future. Um, a typical first grader in terms of formal education they've received, um, typically, uh, well, I guess I would say typically has gone to kindergarten, uh, knows their letters and um, can, can likely can read. Um, off, also though, it is, it is common that a student um, perhaps has done atypical schooling or has, is not yet uh, independently literate or, or reading um, on their own as a first grader. And so while it is um, more independent for a student to be able to read by the time they enter first grade, uh, we, we often engage in um, supporting students to develop those reading skills pretty quickly in their first year at Great River. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, good. Uh, Sarah Auna asks, uh, well, okay, so, okay, so we have, um, we are a two mom family. Do you have any info or observations on how many um, other parents openly identify uh, as LGBTQ plus? Um, you know, I don't have demographics on that and families, but I would say it is common for um, same gender families uh, or um, non, uh, non, um, oh, heterogeneous families, <laughs> I guess I would say. Um, uh, and we also have families who support each other uh, in terms of forming family clubs. So students, students who are non-binary or identify as non-binary um, in the lower elementary, upper elementary, and throughout the high school, I know those families meet with each other regularly. Um, I know that families have uh, also formed groups um, for LGBTQ uh, families, um, also for families uh, I know who have experienced, say, um, divorce or families who have, have two households, uh, families who are, who are dealing with um, sp specific, say, uh, unique home experiences. Um, so I'll, I'll pause there. I'll just say families are building community and it is, it is common uh, at Great River School for a family to have, say, two dads or two moms or any arrangement of parents and loved ones. Um, Elizabeth Graham says, is music or visual art done during the workday on a normal day at the elementary level? Uh, I would just quickly answer yes. Um, both uh, music and uh, artistic expression and visual art are ways to explain and show the things you've learned in a typical lesson. So uh, drawing a picture, making a diagram, um, writing a poem or singing a song are all ways that students could explain their learning. Um, formal music or visual art or physical education instruction though is just done once a week. Um, 
Let's see, how many lower elementary classrooms are at Great River School? We have six lower elementary classrooms, um, about 30 to 35 students per classroom, which uh, if you're doing the math at home um, is about a, a hundred and, uh, let me just do the math apparently right in front of you all, about 195 to 200 students. All right, let's see, uh, Devorah says, um, how many Great River uh, how does Great River support non-binary gender fluid children? Uh, well, we um, orient and train our staff uh, and we also orient and train um, socially in terms of social norms, our students in making sure that um, using say uh, gender pronouns, uh, it would be typical um, uh, and forgive, forgive me, uh, if this is my ninth Zoom meeting of the day. It'd be typical for me to have introduced myself tonight as Sam O'Brien, your head of school. I use he, him pronouns. Uh, that would be a typical introduction in our classrooms. Um, and uh, that just is really the tip of the iceberg of the ways in which we prepare students to think in a non-binary way about their relationships, about their classes, their classmates and their peers, and about um, not just the pronouns that a student uses, but really making sure that a whole identity of a person is respected and asked about and not assumed. Um, and so um, that, that I, I, I'd say that was the general way we create a welcoming and supportive environment for non-binary students um, and, and for all students really. So it's, it's um, uh, I would say it's, it's common, and when I say common, I mean, I think it reflects what research has shown to be um, the uh, occurrence of the experience of non-binary students, at, even at a lower elementary level for some folks, uh, some of our students using they, them pronouns, even in first year. Um, Elizabeth Graham says, how much emphasis on environmental education is done? Uh, I guess I would say, I think a lot of emphasis on environmental education. Um, and we talk about environmental education in connection with um, race and social justice and uh, ecological, uh, I guess at the adolescent level, I would say ecological sovereignty, the idea that there is an ecology outside of humanity that requires our respect for us to keep participating in it. Um, but at lower elementary, I might just say, um, respecting all the living things we see all the plants, all the animals, all the trees, all the rocks, all the minerals, all of them are part of what we respect. Um, and so environmental justice works its way into talking about uh, the environment and exploring it through the way we study science and humanity and uh, society. Let's see, it is, is it easier to get into the school starting in first versus older kids? The simple answer is yes. Forest, it is easier to get into the school starting in first grade, but because we're taking 60 to 65 brand new students in first grade every year, and at the older ages, um, especially say in upper L or seventh or 12th grade, we're taking somewhere between say three and 12 students, depending on the year, how many students switched. Um, we, we have a very high student retention. So uh, especially in the first to sixth grade, over 95% of our students stay every year. Uh, and so first grade is an easier place, but you have to apply to even have a chance. So there's no harm in applying for the enrollment opportunity. So please, please, please fill it out no matter what age your students are. Um, what is the likelihood of a child getting admitted as a second year? Again, that is highly dependent on how many students from the previous year for whatever reason may not return to Great River School. Um, and so I just said about nine out of 10 or higher students return every year in the elementary. Uh, but it is an atypical year, right? So do the pandemic, uh, I don't expect a large student attrition rate, um, but, but it could affect if, if or how families um, return to school. So again, if you have a second year or above, uh, please apply if you're interested and then we can have a conversation if you get the chance to enroll about if it's the right school for you. Um, how do we bring in new students who are new to the Montessori environment in later grades. Uh, I think I talked about this a little bit, but we orient those students specifically. Um, can we view a recording of this? Yes, we will be posting this on our website and emailing it out to everyone on our wait uh, or on enrollment list, excuse me. Um, students do connect with local community uh, and business um, uh, businesses if it overlaps with their course of study. Um, how much time do teachers spend with elementary students per day uh, in distance learning or online learning? Um, we, uh, what are our plans for hybrid or returning to learning in person? Uh, well, first off, uh, I really look forward to our society pulling together the resources and logistics 
to effectively quell this pandemic to allow our students to be in person just as soon as possible. Secondly, we are planning for in-person learning next fall, but everyone should know that likely at any school next fall, students will be wearing masks and really aware of each other's both symptomology and distances. Last, this year we are working to plan for a return to in-person learning. We have not yet announced a date for it. And specifically, uh, we're working to make sure that we can use all the health guidance we have learned over this past month from the state uh, to really make sure we're ready to prepare the environment safely and securely and healthily for our staff and students, and then implement consistent Montessori learning. Right now, our students spend uh, short spurts online and then time connecting by phone uh, or video independently with, with their teachers. Um, but uh, that, that means that teachers are on all day, but students are on for 15 to 20 minute spurts and then doing independent work in between those, uh, those meetings. Um, what percentage of first grade applicants are accepted at Great River? It depends on the year. Um, some years we have about 100 to 120 applications. Some years we have four times that many. Uh, again, we take about 65 students. Uh, what is distance learning like in a Montessori education model? Uh, I can answer this question, though I would not focus on it. I don't expect us to be relying on a distance learning model as a school any longer than, than we have to. Um, so I'll say, <laughs> excuse me. Um, I'll say that there's, there's a little kitten who's joined me tonight, everybody. Um, uh, distance learning looks like um, elementary classrooms having community meetings, still openly uh, knowing each other, caring about each other, and then um, also uh, really building relationships through having small groups of students meet in little breakout rooms with each other and work on projects. Um, uh, distance learning, in case it persists or has to be revisited in the future, will look like, again, small 15 or 20 minute meetings um, uh, with, with teachers to get an orientation to what the work is, and then either work in breakout rooms or independently and reporting back to your teacher and what you did. Um, let's see. Uh, how do you balance the Montessori method with public school curriculum? Um, well, just one moment, everybody, because a small pet at my house is um, taking its way with my belongings. <laughs> Um, so I'm not at school, I'm at home, and this is a new member of our mammalian family here. Um, uh, we balance Montessori method with the public school curriculum by teaching everything through our Montessori method. Um, there isn't a public school curriculum that we uh, engage with in order to sacrifice our Montessori approach. And in fact, specifically, um, the one thing that maybe we are sometimes doing is preparing our students, say, the day before the MCA, with an orientation to what it will look like and what concepts that might look like. But that's only usually in a way that the students opt into that kind of preparation. Um, uh, is there a way elementary students are able to shadow or try a day at school during the pandemic if they're admitted? If you are offered an opportunity for enrollment, then um, you will be able to uh, uh, get a, a more in-depth picture of what a day is like. But even outside of the pandemic, we do not have elementary students shadow for the day, but we do offer parents the opportunity to observe the classroom. Um, uh, when did your school plan to go back to in-person learning? Uh, I know MPS is expected to go back by February 22nd. I, I think actually Minneapolis Public Schools is planning to go back even sooner. Um, specifically, our school is working right now with staff um, to set benchmarks and also to balance the need to set a date our families can um, can plan to go back in person at the lower elementary level only. So we are phasing in first first through third grade, and then and then setting a date for fourth through sixth grade. And we're really also looking carefully at the way that the virus is behaving among students who are older than the age of ten. Um, so right now we're focusing on ages ten and under, and um, we haven't announced a date yet. But when we do announce a date, it will be a six week window working toward a date to go in person. Um, more about the bike program and how fourth and fifth graders participate with it. So our bike shop is run by seventh, generally seventh, eighth, and ninth year students. Uh, do we have opportunities for especially our older um, elementary students to be part of? Oh, there we go. I'm being hunted. I'm being hunted by a feline. Um, uh, our, our fourth and fifth graders um, do can participate, uh, especially say on Wednesday afternoons or um, as a culmination of study. Uh, with older students in, in participating and seeing the bike shop and visiting it. Um, uh, 
And then here, a question, what percentage of the staff are uh, BIPOC or Black, Indigenous, or people of colors? Um, uh, in terms of our educator population of the whole st staff, about 17% of our staff right now uh, identify as, as uh, non-white, a non-white identity. Um, in terms of comparing that to the state of Minnesota, that's higher than average. Uh, but as I said, during the adolescent open house earlier today, um, there's a real, uh, I think, an important uh, direct conversation that all educators in the state of Minnesota have to have that we need more uh, Black, Indigenous, Latinx, uh, Asian people of color to be educators because our students uh, are seeking, especially as they hit junior high and senior high, uh, to make sense of um, why and how does the, does the demographics of the world they see around them, are those demographics not represented in the educators that, that engage with them? And so um, it's on all of us, especially the folks uh, who might look uh, like me, who might be white identifying, uh, to speak openly about that and then do our hardest work to make sure that educators of color are supported, nourished, and are thriving uh, to the best of our ability. So uh, what's the likelihood of being selected in the lottery is our last, oh, here come a couple other questions. Uh, likelihood of being selected in the lottery. Um, specifically, uh, you would be selected in the lottery uh, at a different rate depending on the age you apply. And, and that's the simplest thing I can say. Uh, again, I said, you know, between 100 and, and 200 some people apply for first year and we take 60. Um, you know, between 50 and 300 people apply sometimes for eighth grade and we take between zero and 12. And so the likelihood really depends on the year uh, and how many students are being enrolled. Um, I wish I could give more, uh, but I know this, 0% of, of people are chosen if they don't apply. And the only way that you can get in is by applying. So of everyone who was enrolled at the school, 100% of them filled out the enrollment application. So, um, uh, okay, just a couple more questions. Here we go. Um, for a child that has Montessori preschool background, um, is the school at GRS uh, similar to preschool in terms of materials being used, manipulatives, et cetera? Yes, if you went to a Montessori children's house, it would be very similar through the day. And um, the higher ed or college placement guidance counseling process at Great River, what percentage of students pursue higher ed? Uh, I can, this is an elementary night, but I will, will answer that question happily. Um, generally, uh, of say the, the 60 or so seniors who graduate, um, over 95% of them uh, successfully applied to and were admitted to a four-year institution. Um, uh, about 90% of those students uh, matriculate and go to a, a higher ed institution. And um, really we focus on accessibility. So not just uh, applying and being accepted, but then also really making sure that um, folks work together uh, with our uh, college accessibility director to make a plan for um, the finances of that application process working. So really uh, our college accessibility director, Teresa Hinton Solson, uh, works with our 17 and 18 year olds to really pursue as many possible scholarships and support opportunities uh, to make uh, higher education affordable as possible. Um, you do need to reapply each year. The question is, do we need to reapply each year? So if you applied for a grade level, this year for the fall of 2020, spring of 2021, you do need to reapply each year for each grade in order to stay on uh, that enrollment possible list. And then um, those are all the questions, folks. Uh, thank you very much for attending. I see even everyone's still in attendance. We've run a little, just a little bit over. Um, uh, if you have a, one last question, you can throw it in the Q&A right now. Um, I wanna just I thank you all for not only joining us tonight, uh, but for your patience and um, also for your thoughtful questions. And if there was a question that comes up later or you weren't, uh, you weren't exactly um, thinking of it tonight, then uh, you can always send it to <laughs> Great River School, uh, our website, or um, you can send it to us at office at greatriverschool.org. Um, and in fact, there are just two kittens. They're just very active. And um, my three young mammals who are humans in this house have been pursuing littler mammals and they were successful this week, but everyone's gone to bed. And so now they're coming to me because they're lonely. So thanks. Um, uh, I just want to thank everybody again for attending and um, be well, take care of each other and uh, good night. <laughs>